Hey guys, so I've got an amazing interview today. Uh, in this video, I spoke to Andrew Latour. Now he is the founder of GimbaRed.com, which is a red light therapy company in the States. Now Andrew is a bit of a geek when it comes to red light therapy, and I mean that in a good way. He's very passionate about this stuff. Not only the products, but the science, the technology that goes into it. Uh, he's always learning and yeah, like I said, he's very, very knowledgeable. So he's been my go-to guy for a lot, of, um, a lot of topics, a lot of really technical questions over the years, such as flicker, beam angle, um, power intensities and whatnot. So you may have seen some, some of his work feature on my website and I'm, I've shared a lot of his articles in my um, newsletters and news videos as well. But in this video, we don't just talk about his products and he's got some really unique products, including the new body panel. So we, we talk about that uh, at the end of the video, but we also go deep into, well, we go behind the scenes, I guess, when it comes to setting up a red light therapy company, uh, how hard or how easy it is to set one up. Um, the issues with these clone, say copycat sort of companies we're seeing a lot of today. Um, but we also talk about things such as wavelengths, what the science says about some of these, as I call them, alternative wavelengths, and why we may want to put more emphasis and, and spend more time uh, looking into some of these wavelengths. Uh, we look at power levels or power, power intensity or irradiance, uh, the best way to measure it and the way that most companies are measuring these are, um, power radiance figures and um, they are effectively misleading us in a way. Um, so we talk about that. We also talk about how power may be reaching a, a peak. We may not need any more power than we're currently seeing in some of these panels. So he shares his his views on that. Um, and we go we, yeah, we go down lots of different tangents. It's, it's quite a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Uh, and it was great to get some of these ideas out uh, to the world. I will mention uh, Andrew has shared a discount code with you guys. It is code Alex, A-L-E-X. It will save you, I believe, 10% on his products. So um, if you do want to head over to gimbred.com, be sure to use that discount code. All right, guys, let's get into it. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to have this call today. I'm really excited to pick your brain. I think a lot of the viewers are going to learn a lot. Um, your blog is, is very impressive and I know you've been my go-to guy uh, over the years for a lot of the technical questions, so I can't wait to dive into some of these uh, topics. But before we get into that, tell me, how did you get into red light therapy? And tell me a bit about your background as an engineer, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I was an engineer. I went to school for chemical engineering. I've got a bachelor, bachelor's degree from UConn. And, um, you know, obviously I just had no, you know, education on health or anything like that. I've always struggled with uh, things like my weight and my sleep and my energy. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously I made it through school all right. Um, but then I, I kind of learned from uh, my wife uh, about some of these alternative therapies. Like she introduced me to uh, the biomat, which is a far infrared heating mat. Um, you know, I, I started following um, Dave Asprey and Bulletproof, and I got into the Bulletproof diet. Um, and, you know, really, once I got into that biohacking sphere, uh, which is what, you know, you've, you've kind of been a part of as well for a long time. Once I got into biohacking and looking at studies and looking at the science, and, um, you know, I was able to kind of apply my own kind of rationale of being a science-minded person and saying, oh yeah, you know, there's a lot that we can do to control our health, to try out different techniques. Um, you know, our, our DNA and our health isn't written in stone of, of what you can and can't do. And that was really liberating for me. So, you know, I started trying out all these different things. Um, I started going to the Bulletproof conferences, like um, I think the, uh, some of the 2016 and 2017 conferences. And I started to see these red light therapy panels pop up at, at the conferences, all these other gadgets as well. And, you know, there were only a couple brands back in uh, 2017 when uh, you and I got into this kind of stuff. And there, you know, they were, they were highly priced. Um, there was a lot of kind of questions about them. There's a lot of, uh, you know, debate back and forth of what to get and what, what not to get. And there really, you know, there weren't just, just weren't any options. And so, you know, I was looking for red light therapy for myself, uh, for back pain, for energy. Uh, you know, I was getting to, into like circadian rhythm stuff with 
wearing blue blockers at night um, and, and red light therapy helps a lot with uh, circadian rhythm and melatonin production. And, you know, I was really baffled. I was like, LEDs, you know, generally shouldn't, shouldn't cost a lot of money, right? Um, you know, I used to pick them up by the bag full at, at the local radio shack. Now they're out of business. So people don't realize like this stuff used to be like really cheap. You could just pick it up. Um, and so, you know, that was, I, I kind of held back from buying any of those products. And, you know, if I had just bought one of those and there'd be no business here. Um, and then I start, I was spending some time in China because uh, my wife's job kind of took, took us around the world. Uh, that's how I ended up in New Zealand. And I visited you one time, um, but we ended up in China and I, I had left my job to, to um, travel and I started exploring these like electronics markets in, in China. I went to trade shows and fairs and I was like, wow, I'm really in the basket of where all these devices are being manufactured, where the experts are, where all the supply chain is. And I was like, you know, going to these marketplaces and I was stumbling over bags of LEDs and, you know, I, I could buy a, a bag full of LEDs for like 10 bucks. Like, you know what I mean? And so I was like, well, I could really hook something up here and work with work with a manufacturer here, get it all set up. Um, that's what I did a lot as an engineer. You'd go visit a manufacturer or a supplier and you go check them out, make sure they're legit, make sure they can deliver what you need them to deliver. So it was just kind of the perfect opportunity for me to figure that out. Um, and then, you know, I just kind of took the plunge, ordered, ordered a bunch of panels to my specifications. I had them third party tested before I even sold a single panel. Uh, and I launched in January, 2018, and I sold out my whole inventory in 24 hours yeah. um, because, again, back in 2018, you know, people don't understand when they're shopping for red light therapy right now. And there's literally dozens of panels. There's dozens of companies you can get it from Amazon, dozens of people on AliExpress, on Alibaba. Those don't those didn't even exist. Like, you know, what I mean, it was barren. Um, so <laughs> 2018, when I got to market was like just that perfect inflection point. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert in marketing or, or anything like that. It just hit right at the perfect time. And, uh, you know, I kind of just got in there right at the right time at the right place. Yeah, nice. And it's, it's a pretty neat story. And, it, and it's funny how many red light therapy companies have been founded by people who have had a similar journey, not necessarily going to China and whatnot, but um, similar journey on the health front, you know, like had health issues and yeah. then stumbled upon red light therapy, realized it was a total game changer. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to, you know, share this with the world. Uh, I did two reviews um, just recently on two new companies and I looked up their backstory, same thing. Like one had some severe skin issues, the other was an athlete, red light therapy, game changer. But um, what separates you apart from a lot of these other people, a lot of these other companies is, yeah, your your engineering background and how you approach, especially a lot of the, the technical um, things when it comes to, you know, designing these lights and, and or panels and, um, you know, what goes into them and whatnot. But also the fact that, yeah, you, you've been to the... Uh, the factory, so to speak, like you, you were in China yeah. and um, that's, that's something that a lot of these companies that we are seeing, especially like these new ones popping up every few months, there seems to be another a company uh, starting up. Yeah. A lot of these I'm noticing are selling panels that look identical to you know, another company. And I, I see them, like I get a lot, I've literally got 30 odd panels in my, in my uh, house at the moment. <laughs> and and if you peeled off the sticker and changed the box a little bit, like you wouldn't know the difference between them. So as someone who has been in the space and also been to China and, um, you know, you've been, you've been involved in a lot of, uh, you know, what's going on in the industry and stuff. So tell me how easy is it for someone to start up a red light therapy company and, um, you know, just buy some panels from China um is there is there do you need to go over to China to get something like that started up? Do you need to have like a, electrical engineer on board to help help you like how easy is it or is it or is it extremely difficult like tell me about that your thoughts at least yeah so I mean um you you know you you can see it like in, and that's the thing if you look around and you see all these kind of copy and paste panels uh you know everyone's kind of selling a similar thing you do start to you know realize they're all coming from a similar source and then getting rebranded 
And, you know, you can even find on Amazon any, you know, kind of generic product. That's what's happening all over Amazon is that uh, products are just getting rebranded. There's formulas and there's all these gurus that'll teach you how to get rich quick by using Amazon uh, FBA, like the fulfilled by Amazon stuff. And so it seems like red light therapy, unfortunately, has kind of gone down that same road mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, there's uh, maybe a, a dozen or, or probably more suppliers in China that are making these panels. Um, and, you know, th- there's nothing stopping a, an average person from going, asking them for, hey, I want a panel with certain, you know, and you can customize it. You can say, I want certain wavelengths. I want a certain logo or brand on it. Um, you know, and there's really a very low MOQ. Well, like when I started, <laughs> at least there, there was like higher MOQs. Uh, no one was really doing this stuff. You had to really like vet out your sources because nobody knew what, what I was asking for. Like, you know, when you're, when you're asking for certain wavelengths and you're asking for um, low flicker drivers and you're, you're showing them measure, measurements of EMFs. I was sending these, this feedback to my suppliers. I was like, we got to get these numbers down. And they're like, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I was, I, I do a lot educating my own suppliers and educating the, the people in China of, of what, what it is and what they're doing. Um, but nowadays it just seems like, yeah, you know, you can, you can buy a website, you can use Shopify um, as a hosting um, for your, for your uh, e-commerce platform. And there's very low MOQ uh, minimum order quantity. So you could buy like just five panels and just start a business, you know, just say, I, I'm a, I'm a new business. I'm, I'm red light, uh, you know, dude 420. And I'm selling, I'm selling panels now. So um, there's really no, there's no barrier to entry other than uh, I guess a few of the basics like registering your business um, with whatever local authorities there might be. Um, And uh, you know, import, you know, just kind of figuring out how to import stuff. Um, But really, yeah, there's, and you know, I'm talking from firsthand experience. I'm just an engineer you know, I got some uh, kind of business training from my corporate background in, in some of the corporate engineering world. Um, so you learn about business cases, you learn about how to justify your projects. Um, but really, you know, this was all new for me. And it was a test for myself to see if I could run my own business and, and do these things and, and, and get outside of my comfort zone too. So um, it was a big test for me and, and, and talking to people and running social media and doing all this stuff it, it's a big uh commitment um but unfortunately yeah we see most people have more you know i've seen the successful businesses you know that are selling a lot are more of a business background they know how to do you know, optimize the marketing optimize the google ads the facebook ads the instagram ads if you google search uh, red light therapy one time those those companies at the top of the list, those are the ones that know how to how to optimize all the ads. Um, and you click on them once and you get a cookie on your browser and then they're in all your social media. Um, you know, I mean, so so it's more of a formulaic thing of understanding how to optimize the marketing as opposed to understanding the technical aspects. And a lot of that comes later, right? Like, you know, I think uh, even Juve kind of started out doing this, this kind of stuff. They were in, you know, the first generation panels, they, they, they really didn't do much with, they just pop, plopped in the 660 and 850 LEDs. And, you know, some people started complaining about things like Flickr and EMFs. And so Juve started to learn from their own customers and, and from feedback, hopefully. Um, and, and I think in your latest round of measurements, at least the flicker was reduced for most panels, mm-hmm. the EMFs much better on a lot of these panels. So I think most companies kind of start out the same way I did mm-hmm. with just, you know, and you can do, um, drop shipping too. So drop shipping is where you don't even hold any in- inventory in your local environment. The, the, the Chinese companies hold your inventory and they just ship directly to your consumer Um, So that's called drop shipping. And so you can set that up and then you have zero inventory and you just start a business with no, with nothing at all. So yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. It is rather fascinating. And I don't, I didn't intend, I didn't ask that question as a, to, to discredit the companies that have set up uh, companies and that, because 
I, um, I've been involved in e-commerce before and I know there is a lot of work. Like it's, yeah, you can whip up a website and find a product and get a Facebook account all set up in an afternoon. But yeah, as you mentioned, there's a lot to it. Um, there's a lot to it on the marketing side, logistics and, and customer care and whatnot. So I totally get that. And I think as well, like, and, and this is, I'm sure you've had a lot to do on this front. Um, the products we're seeing now from these companies that are just popping up and like these clone companies and stuff, clone product companies, I guess. Um, yeah, that they're really actually really good panels compared to say first generation Juve and stuff like that. Like we're seeing right. flicker free LEDs. We're seeing really low EMF readings. We're seeing the power intensity up, you know, the control panels are nicer to use. And so that's, um, yeah, that's definitely a result of, I hope, the stuff I've been doing, you know, asking the questions, obviously yeah. you like, and your blog, which has been amazing. Um, and I know there's a few other companies out there as well that, that, are that are passionate about the technology and are doing the research and, you know, pushing the, the companies in China to really step up. So it's, yeah, it's funny. I mean, as a whole, like, yeah, it's probably better for society and the industry in that because there's more, more choice. The price points probably right. come down and the standard has, has risen, but at the same time, uh, you know, I get questions from people all the time, like, hey, what about this company? And I see that the website's only been up for two months. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's probably good. But hey, if anything goes wrong, you know, this company could fall, you know, like we don't know anything about them versus someone like yourself right. or Juve or Platinum that have been around for like 10 years. So there's a lot to take on board. And I try to cover that in my reviews anyway. Um, So do you know if there's any companies that actually have like hands-on you know a crew in china or malaysia because i know juva manufacturing in malaysia now like or are they all just sort of like is there is there quality control checks in place are, are companies actually getting hands their hands dirty in terms of like look send me some some um prototypes and we want to do some testing and engineering sort of thing or or is it all just send me a few emails and if there's a customer that's not happy we'll we'll go back and figure out what went wrong like is is yeah. what's your thoughts on that based on your experience? Uh, you know, I yeah, I can tell you what I do. Um, you know, and I can only speculate what what other companies are doing or or how they start out. Um, you know, I I you know am, am very meticulous about my quality controls, and I do a lot of testing of my panels. Uh, like I said, I've gotten third party testing probably before any other red light panel company has has gotten third party testing, and I was transparent with the information, with the, with the numbers, even though they kind of painted me in a bad light compared to some of the solar power meters that, that the companies have been using. And, you know, I think that's a big step of, you know, the, the companies that that's even, you know, even started out or new or old, they're getting their measurements from their suppliers in China. So the suppliers in China, a lot of times they have the solar power meters they're testing the, the power consumption and things like that. They're giving you this rating of like, oh, it's 900 watts or 1800 watts or what, you know, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, a lot of times they're just trusting the numbers from, from, the, from the Chinese manufacturers, which uh, we know they're, you know, a lot of times they're using the wrong test equipment to start with. And then they're not double checking it. Well, like, you know, obviously for any engineering thing, I've outsourced products and manufacturing for my real businesses. And you always double check all the parameters, especially if it's something that's coming from overseas. You double check all your measurements. Uh, does it meet the specifications you, you required? Uh, you do your own third-party testing in your own labs or, or in third-party labs. And so that's the, the level of diligence that I go through. And then, uh, you know, over the years, I bought all my own test equipment too. So I, I measure at least a couple panels from every batch and I check them out, make sure each batch, you know, you can have batch to batch yeah. variability or defects. And, you know, if a company's not even checking their, their first product or any of their products, you know, we're probably not going to trust that they're checking, you know, multiple products at a time. So, um, you know, it is good. Yeah, you've got to have warranty set up. You've got to have a plan for customer service. Even I have occasional defects. So, you know, you know, we all have to be realistic about that. Any, any big company or small company, if you're mass producing something, there's some uh, probability that a product's going to fail. And then how do you plan on fixing it for the customer? And that's part of the interaction that, you know, if you have a bad time with, with a customer 
service interaction. That's what really defines a company. And hopefully most people don't even have to encounter that. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's got to be there in place. Yeah, totally. So let's let's talk about testing power levels or irradiance, as, as we often refer it to. Um, why should someone just not use a solar meter or, or why should someone not uh, put any credibility into the figure that you know companies say hey look this is the figure based on our solar solar meter what's the issue with solar meters and what do you think is the best way to test power levels from these panels yeah yeah and you know that's that's one of the first things i got into of if i'm starting a business i want to do things right i'm not, you know i'm not going to pretend like i'm an optical engineer and start measuring you know find a random product and start measuring right, right away. Uh, my training is always to, if I'm not an expert, you find an expert, you find a third party and you get it tested elsewhere. So that way, if there is a problem, at least I can say I did the best possible, mm -hmm. uh, you know, amount of work into sending it out to a professional lab and they did their diligence and, and they did everything the right way. Um, so the problem that I found with solar power meters is that you know, they're very common in uh, what, what the name implies is they're, they're used for measuring solar intensity in watts per meter squared usually, uh, which is similar enough to the units that we look for in intensity of red light therapy. So that's why a lot of companies got confused and started using these in the first place because you can easily convert watts per meter squared to milliwatts per centimeter squared. Um, it's, it's a very easy, um, decimal place conversion because it's all metric system so uh, that's nice but what you so you and then you you can look up the specification it says oh yeah we can measure between 400 nanometers to 1100 nanometers which again if you presume that you've got leds that are only 660 and 850 or you know it's within that range so you're measuring the total intensity from that range uh, so a lot of companies they didn't do their diligence and really validate the solar power meter to say uh, you know, oh, can I use this for an application? It's obviously used for measuring sunlight for solar cells and for grow lights and, and other industries. <laughs> if you're taking something and you're going to use it for an off-label purpose, like measuring the red and near-infrared LED, then you have to be very careful about validating that's the right thing to do. I would never go into like a workplace and say, oh, boss, I've got this really cheap solar power meter. We're going to start measuring things with it. It's, it's going to be great. And then, you know, if I'm in aerospace, airplanes start falling out of the sky. And if you're making medical devices, people start dying and say, oh, no, you know, it's just an honest mistake. I, I killed a bunch of people because I used the wrong measurement tool. There's no industry that I can ever think of that would allow like just such a blatant negligence of, of using the wrong kind of test meter. Um, so I'll get to the point of why exactly they don't work is because they use a silicone photodiode, which is a very common diode even for laser power meters and they have a very clear responsivity curve that increases in responsiveness as you get into the longer wavelength so even though it says it can measure between 400 and 1100 it's got it increases as the wavelength increases uh, to the point where if you're measuring near infrared leds at 850 it's almost going to double your right. your measurement compared to reality so um, so that, you know, it's calibrated for full spectrum sunlight and no. it kind of gives you some sort of average because it's assuming your source um, and a lot of laser power meters, you need to change your, your um, correction factor based on the wavelength. Um, and the same thing applies. So you have to get the right wavelength yeah. and make sure it's calibrated for that source. Otherwise, the responsivi responsivity works against you. You get falsely high numbers. And it's really consistent too. I just released a brand new blog where you can correlate the third party measurements to the solar power meters and you can get a consistent curve. And then, and then I can build a correction calculator, which I did for my blog. And you can input your solar power meter measurements and it gives you a more realistic correction factor because yeah. we did side by side measurements of the solar power meter and the third party lab meter. So the third party lab uses... Um, an international light technologies 950. Uh, that's the, the kind of brand and model of their light uh, sensor. It's a uh, spectroradiometer, which means it 
diffracts all the wavelengths, and then it measures the width, the intensity of every single wavelength. And then you can yeah. sum all that up and you get the total intensity. So that seems after I've gone back and forth with laser power meters and, and spectral radiometers and your Hopo color, I bought one too. Yeah. The Hopo color spectral radiometer that does the same thing. It splits up the the wavelengths so you can analyze the wavelengths which is awesome too mm -hmm. and confirm you're getting the right wavelengths but then also you get that full intensity measurement and it's you don't have to rely on on the the diodes and, and getting correction factors because usually it's calibrated the right way so that seems to be the th best thing to do is use a spectral radiometer use a cosine correction mm -hmm. uh, filter that's the white milky filter that you see on the front of your yeah. uh, hopo color yeah. And that helps kind of take in, especially like lasers are non-divergent, but for LEDs, you need to understand it's a divergent light source. So uh, light could be reflecting off of the sensor if you use the wrong type of laser power meter. Right. Um, so the cosine correction really helps with that. So um, that seems to be the best way to go. But unfortunately, calibrated spectral radiometers are pretty expensive. Like as far as I can find that Hopo color, um, I forget the exact model number, but they have a, a bunch of different ones. It's yeah. like, oh, oh like it? zero HS or something. Oh, um, uh, you'll go check it. I have one nearby too. Yeah, this is, this is the one uh, that I have. Hopo color uh, OHSP-350F. Um, yeah. You know, the wavelength range is 380 to 1050 nanometers yeah. on the screen. And so a new one is about uh, 2,500 bucks, yes, which that's about right. is like pretty cheap for a spectral radiometer because I've gotten quotes for all kinds of different brands. That's the cheapest one I, that I've found pretty much yeah. on the market. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm working on a new uh, measurement meter. Uh, that I hope to, to launch as its own meter that can help really? people measure things. Um, I'm working with a, a laboratory that's calibrating uh, a, a, a more of like that the silicone di diode, but they're using the right kinds of filters and the right kinds of calibration. So that way you can get it in there. It's going to be much cheaper. It's maybe like a thousand bucks, yeah. but it's going to be a game changer, especially for research institutions, for uh, manufacturers for people that want to measure things uh, simply and a little bit more cheaply. Um, so I've been, that's what I've been working on on the side is yeah, right. like a better, more affordable measurement tool um, that, that could hopefully, you know, even the research, like the clinical research, they'll have multiple studies and editorials where they say there's, there's measurement problems that commercial devices that they're measuring mm -hmm. are wrong. And so it happens with lasers. It happens in the LED panel industry. So it's happening all over. Um, and, you know, there just seems like, you know, what's really going on. It, you know, a lot of it's obviously honest mistakes and some mm -hmm. ignorance that, that mm -hmm. they used the wrong measurement tool to begin with. Um, but now I think, you know, I'm trying to put out more information so people can understand what's really going wrong and, and how do you fix it? Like, I, you know, I don't wanna just point out a problem that, oh, everyone else is doing it wrong. So you have to buy from me. Yeah. I'm trying to give you the solutions and say, hey, there are affordable options. Um, you know, even if you get a quote from a, a third party lab, you can get testing for a lot of different measurements. You can get intensity, spectrum, flicker, and mm -hmm. all this stuff for, you know, maybe a thousand bucks at Light Lab International in Allentown, Pennsylvania. There's a couple other labs that you can get quotes for. So um, there's really not a big excuse on the financial end to say, oh, I can't afford proper measurements or, yeah. or there's no standards or whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's considering the margins some of these companies are making, they can afford totally. proper measurements. And, you know, they have to be brave enough to say, hey, maybe we were wrong <laughs> before, yeah. you know, again, uh, uh, you know, I can, I'll pick on Juve because, uh, why not? But to, you know, Juve came out, we've got, oh, we've got a hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared at six inches away. That was there. Yeah. You know, they were steamrolling the whole industry, yeah. uh, especially with their first generation panel with this claim. And, you know, they've really reeled back and they started using little asterisks and, and saying, oh, well, we're a hundred milliwatts per centimeter squared. And there's this tiny asterisk that says at the device surface. Yeah 
you know, which is like a really vague and weird claim. Um, but, you know, you want to know the actual intensity at the distance you're using it. Using so it. Yeah. Uh, they, they started to really reel back and, and then they started saying, oh, you need to know more about the total intensity. Yeah. And they started switching the measurement technique and they said, oh, you know what? Forget about intensity. Yeah. We lied about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about this other thing now. It's called yeah. total intensity and total watts. And if nobody else is doing it, then, then they're scamming you. And now we're not scamming you because we made up a new thing to tell you. And it's like, yeah. what happened? Um, but nobody bought it. Everyone's still talking about intensity, totally. but, but we need to get a little bit more realistic about it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, I, when I first started in this space as a consumer, like I wasn't reviewing them or anything. I was like, wow. And yeah, it was all about the hundred milliwatts. And, and I was like, wow, you know, you want the most powerful one out there. And to this day, testing at six inches with my spectrometer here, I don't think any panel has hit, and this is what five, six years after the first juice, you know, hit the market. I don't think we're, I don't even think we're at 100 milliwatts. I think 90 something with one of the platinum LED panels. That's the highest reading yeah. I've seen as a peak and, reading. And that's, not a, and that's uh, a hot spot, right? And that's, that's a hot a, spot. Yeah, and we might talk more about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's three generations of panels um, after those claims. And yet still companies right. on their website have, you know, over 100 milliwatts uh, centimeters, you know, for, at six inches. And it's like, oh, my God. Um, so anyway, and that's why I personally, I like, I get questions all the time, YouTube comments, emails, everything, right? Um, and people say, oh, what about this one? And, and this company said they have this much power and your review of this panel was like half that. So isn't that one better? And it's like, look, I right. personally, I, when I'm preparing my notes for a research panel, uh, like re reviewing a panel or something, I don't even, I go to the website to look at, you know, specs, size, weight, all that sort of stuff. But I don't even look at the claimed uh, power, power radiance. Like I don't even, I, don't, I, I skim straight past it because it's irrelevant. And then right. I will then test it using this device. Right. With, preset parameters that I use for every device. And then um, I will then take that reading. And then that's what I'll use to make comparisons because I've then controlled those variables. And I've got a device that I know is, is reasonably accurate. Sure, I could pay a thousand dollars or whatever it's going to cost here in New Zealand to get each um, panel tested in a lab. But um, I've had some lab re uh, reports you know, from some companies that have done testing. They've sent me the lab reports. I've cross-checked it with my panel and we're five percent, you know, margin yeah. of error, which which is pretty good considering like I'm just getting a roller marking six inches, holding it, right. you know, like it's pretty good. So so because of those reasons, I that's why I just keep doing what I'm doing. And um, and I think it's I think it's pretty like it's pretty accurate, it's pretty reliable. Like you're seeing the platinum, new platinum panels come out, and yep, they're getting more powerful. You know, just it makes yeah. sense, like it, it's working the way it's it should be working. Um but, and I've never used a solar meter. I've never, um, early on, I think it was conversations with you. Like it, it all made sense when you were telling me like a solar meter is designed to measure the sun. Like you were saying, like, right. and the, the data it's um, crunching, like it's, it's using assumptions that you're measuring the sun. So um, it's, it's, I, I noticed as an industry, yeah, like you said, people are backing away from that now, which is good. Um but, and so when people ask me, oh, well, what do you think of these power readings? I'm just like, hey, look, I don't mean to be uh, promoting my channel or anything here, but just look at the readings on my reviews and compare them. And I've, I've been chipping away at that Excel document where I publish all the data as well. So yeah, uh, that, was, that was a really good answer and showed a lot of the backstory. Um, so for people out there that have been a bit confused, hopefully you know, your answer helped uh, get them up to speed. But following up on that question, we are now seeing power readings that are you know, quite high, right? Um, does it get to a point where it is more always better? Like, is, is there, do we want panels to get more and more um, powerful or right. does it get dangerous? Does it get, is there a, a limitation from a technology point of view? Like from a scientific biological impact, are we at peak red light therapy? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, I've always been on the opposite end of the spectrum where where I say, no, it's not about being more powerful. So maybe, you know, maybe you could say that's my bias, but my bias is usually pretty heavily based on 
the scientific research and, and what I've tested out and what I've observed with, with people's reactions to this. And I'd say, yeah, we're, we're getting, you know, with your latest review, and if you're realistic with the intensity measurements that you took, and I do agree with you, your hopo color or the hopo color I got is, is pretty, pretty spot on. So in terms of intensity, so I like that. Um, but when you're seeing numbers like uh, 70 milliwatts per centimeter squared or 80, um, you're getting very close to the danger zone of, of being too much. And what that means is, uh, you know, it's supposed to be low level light therapy, LLLT, that's the acronym. It was originally low level laser therapy. Um, and then photobiomodulation is by definition, uh, low intensity, uh, non-thermal, not heating uh, uh, therapy. So that's all the studies are designed specifically to not heat the tissue too much. You know, you're naturally going to get a little bit of heat, uh, but if you get too much intensity, uh, even in, in the proper wavelengths, too much intensity, you're going to start feeling that as warmth, as heat, um, especially, you know, there's more and more dangers for the eyes as well. You know, a lot of people get confused by that of like, oh, they're told by a lot of people that it's good for your eyes. It's going to cure your eyes. It's, it's, you know, you don't have to worry about it, but you do have to worry about it. Like any other thing in life, if you drink too much water, you're going to die. You know, you need water to survive, but if you drink too much water, you die. But nobody runs around saying, oh my God, don't drink, don't, don't drink water. You're going to die. It's just like red light therapy. It's not like you need, if you have an extreme excess of intensity, then you have to start worrying about your eyes. And then, you know, that's why a lot of companies are including goggles with their panels. But again, you need to be realistic with the intensity. There are some standards about uh, intensity for near infrared with the eyes, because um, imagine like all those um, security cameras that's all, all over the world, all this extra monitoring, and they're using near infrared diodes, mm -hmm. um, especially as like the night, night yeah. cameras. That's why you see it in that kind of gray scale. Um, so they're using near infrared diodes and they're aiming near infrared on people all day long, every day. Mm -hmm. So they've already done those safety evaluations that say, hey, if we're spying on people all day with near infrared uh, diodes, then we have to make sure it's safe enough that we're not hurting their eyes. So there are intensity standards. And, and again, it's a dose response type of thing. If you stare at a high intensity diode with your eyes wide open for a very long period of time, you know, that's, that's not a good idea. But if, you know, a lot of times you can look off to the side or you can uh, close your eyes for periods of time, you know, and your eyes will block and reflect some of the light and diffuse the light. Uh, sometimes it seems brighter when you close your eyes because it diffuses the light all the way around your eyeball. Right. Um, and then you start to feel, yeah, you start, if you, even if you're protecting your eyes, you'll start to feel more warmth on your skin. And that's when you know your intensities kind of cross that boundary. And again, it depends on your skin type. It depends on your skin sensitivity. Um, so you, everyone needs to adjust their distance to the panel according to if they're feeling a lot of heat, if they're feeling a lot of warmth, that does feel nice and you get instant gratification Ooh. for it. Uh, and I think <laughs> there's kind of this crossover where, um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of debate about heat lamps mm -hmm. and the, the heat lamps all want to claim that they're photobiomodulation. Mm -hmm. And now all the photobiomodulation LED panels want to give you heat. <laughs> so, you know, there's kind of this weird crossover of like everyone wants to do everything, but but nothing actually. Um, so you get too much heat on your skin. Obviously you can get, um, you know, and I see this on social media a lot more often than I did five years ago. People yeah. complaining about, oh, I've got this weird red, uh, uh, you know, skin sensation, almost like a sunburn, but it's like um, erthema okay. where it's overheating yeah. your skin. You get that redness. It's almost, if it, you know, if you don't know any better, you would call it a sunburn. Mm -hmm. um, so you're overheated your skin, your skin, you know, got a little bit inflamed for that. Um, and you need to like take a break for a while. So you don't keep agitating it. Mm -hmm. um, so you I'm, I'm seeing a lot more of that. Um, again, especially with females, I wrote a big blog about I think females are, are maybe more sensitive to the heat and to, to too high of intensity. Um, but it can happen with anyone. And then, you know, and then you're starting to see a little bit more complaints about um, skin pigmentation that that people's, you know, skins might be darkening, you might be getting more freckles, you might be getting 
um, you know, more um, if you've got pre-existing, uh, uh, you know, pigmentation problems, it could exacerbate it with too much intensity. And again, there's a lot, you know, and that's the fine line. There's a lot of studies using low intensity can actually help those, those mm -hmm. problems mm -hmm. too much. You get the heat, you get, you know, you, you get into more problems. So um, I would look very closely at if you do another round of red light therapy mm -hmm. panels in a couple of years, if they're going to be keep cranking up the intensity, there needs to be, you know, a lot of mitigations and disclaimers that people either need to be much further away from the panels, not six yeah. inches away anymore. You're going to be on the opposite end of the room <laughs> uh, with some of these panels because then they're also using very narrow beam angles. Yeah. So you have no control over the intensity because they've, they've narrowed the beam angle like it's a laser. And now you're like, you can stay on the opposite side of the room. Yeah, right. and get, you have no the intensity doesn't drop because everyone says you've got the inverse square law where it, it's a, a you know it, the intensity drops with distance yeah but you can manipulate that by using narrower beam angles it's not like right. uh, you know the calculation always changes depending on how many leds you have the beam angle and things like that so you can still you know it's like a laser you can have a very it, it follows the same rules Hmm. but it can go on for miles and miles if it's if it's too concentrated it's going to be interesting to see what the industry industry does like yeah. um if if all of a sudden you know i think platinum might have read probably to the top power you know the most powerful panels that i have tested at the moment right and it's going to be interesting to see what they do with their next generation yeah. are they going to push for more or are they just going to hold there and then it'll be interesting to see what other companies do. We'll, we'll like, let's let's assume that they just hold at those sort of levels and bring in some other features and, and whatever to you know improve the panel. Um, whether other companies will then try leapfrog them, you know, to take that title as right. the most powerful panel because I, that will sell, right? Like people will will yeah. want to buy the most powerful. I mean, it's still hard. Like even with my reviews and that, it's still something that I reward. You know, like I, a panel that's putting out more pan, uh, power. Like good on them. Um, so it is going to be interesting to see how it plays out. I do like what Platinum have done. And I know Juve also have the ability, uh, though it's a little bit more difficult to utilize, and that's the ability to drop the power intensity down. Uh, I, I actually use that now because I've got four Biomax 900 set up. And um, some days I'm doing like a warm up before my training and I'm, I'm playing around with katsu bands and, and breathing techniques and all this. And I might do 15, 20 minutes before a workout. And I may have already done red light therapy that day, or, you know, I've done a few sessions this week. Um, so I just kind of, that's like my warm up sort of Zen space, you know, but I know I don't want to overload the body. So I'll just go in and drop, drop the intensities right down, you know, it's a 10% or okay. whatever. So I like that ability, uh, especially as, you know, you're learning more about, um the potential downsides and 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 you've really only touched on surface level uh issues with with uh too much power like what's going on you know at a cellular level what's going on you know like long-term yeah. use can you can you totally change things so so it's really interesting and it's something i still like i look at i try to figure out answers to this because i get questions all the time like what's the optimal dosing and all that and i just i don't know i just, I just give up i'm right. just like you know what this is what's worked well for me over the years I understand yeah. that panels are getting more powerful. So I, I'm shortening my um, treatment times, you know, instead of 20 minutes, I'm doing five or 10 uh, or standing further away though. Typically I stand reasonably close. So I just bring it down and um, yeah, like I, I'm conscious of that, um, but it's, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting. And I just know that's worked well for me. So when people ask, I just say, look, experiment, you know, try it five minutes a day, maybe Monday to Friday and just see like, does that tooth pain, go away um yeah. great if it only goes away a little bit maybe up it you know down it, experiment and unfortunately not many people want to do that you know they just want to know tell me what to do right, right? that's right <laughs> and that's i think uh we, we we're biohackers and we are we're early adopters and we experiment with our own bodies and i think when it, you know red light therapy starts to get adopted by the mainstream you start applying too much of the mainstream mentality of like oh here's a medical device I want to get a backdoor prescription from, you know, a doctor or an influencer and then just follow that prescription and cure my thing. Cause you yeah. know, that's the, 
the Western medical model, that's the, the establishment, but you have to be kind of more open-minded that these are more alternative therapies or more, more holistic therapies that, you know, it's very hard to dose any kind of supplement like, oh, how much vitamin C should I take right. to yeah. help with my Lyme, di my Lyme disease? And it's like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's the same kind of thing with red light therapy. You have to understand all these parameters, intensity, distance, how often you do it, what time of day, yeah. um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, when you time it with sleep or, or, or other activities and tailor it and, you know, don't be afraid to test things out and be like, yeah. oh, you know, I did it at night and it kept me up and, and I didn't sleep well. So don't do it at night, do it more in the morning or vice versa. You did it at night and you slept great. So keep doing that. Um, so there is this aspect. I think, you know, a lot of people to get too caught up of like, oh, I want, a prescription for how to use this thing. Uh, it, it doesn't really exist. Um, you know, you, we can give guidelines on kind of that rough starting point. And, and that, you know, a lot of times that works very well, you know, mm. red light therapy is very forgiving. If you use more too much, a little too little, you know, it's very forgiving overall. Um, you know, but always starting with like a reasonable starting point, you don't have to jump right in and do a long dose. Uh, yeah. or, or a high intensity and feel like you need, need to do something more. Um, I, I know a lot of people get excited when they first spend a thousand dollars on a panel and you're like, ah, oh, I got to get benefits yeah. right away to justify my, my purchase. Yeah. Um, but, you know, really understand those, those different variables. And that's what I go through a lot with my blog of like, Hey, you know, understand why you were doing certain things, why we're doing it for so, you know, for 20 minutes and not 10 minutes or, or 30 mm -hmm. minutes why we're doing it once a day versus five times a day or, or, you know, once a week, you know, and you can understand that and tailor it to your own needs. Yeah. Now, and you touched on a, a neat point there when you mentioned vitamin C and like, at least with vitamin C and, and if you're testing it or experimenting or, or doing some research on it, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to measure and track, right? Like you've got the vitamin C, ascorbic acid, you've got, the dose amount, maybe you can play around with timing and, and like, you know, frequency and whatnot, but that's really about it, right? With red light therapy, you have the power output from the, the panel. You have the distance you're standing from the panel because that's, you know, I stand pretty close to my panels. I always have, and that's just how I use it. Um, I'm not a fan of like the 12 inches. Away. I just feel like a bit funny. I guess that's because I had the early weak ones and I was. Yeah, you had the tubes, the early yeah, tubes. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just got to be pretty close. Really close to it. And, and that's why now I'm doing shorter uh, treatment times. That. But yeah, you've got distance yeah. from the panel. You've then got wavelengths, um, 668, 50, but you got all these, what I refer to as the alternative wavelengths. Uh, so you've got that variable. You've got... Um, the size of the panel and stuff like, and, and, size, and yeah. where the treatment is uh, you've got, are you wearing clothing? Like maybe you're wearing shorts, but your shirt's off, you know, uh, you've right. got all that stuff. You've got your skin color. You've got here. Like if someone's really hairy, like all of these <laughs> variables, time of the day, like you mentioned, um, you've then got the, the combination of wavelengths, like the 660 and 850 together have a different impact on the body of 660 on its own. And it's like, it's, we, obviously my channel is growing, um, with all the red light therapy content I'm putting out and so many people just want to know, yeah. Like, Hey, can you give me a, uh, how to use the panels for arthritis or right. recovery and stuff? And we thought about it. Like I was going to do, I was going to go through all the science and try and come up with some recommended protocols. And yeah, recently I put a video up saying, no, I'm not going to do that now. And, and there were two reasons. The first was, it was just too complicated. <laughs> just like, how do you yeah. like, even if we could find that 660 for, 20 minutes, five times a week uh, at six inches is going to be good for, I don't know, overall body inflammation, whatever it may be. I don't, I don't know. I'm just making stuff up here. To then put that out there in the world, people <laughs> like, okay, does that, that, what happens if someone's got a juve one and someone's got a juve three? What happens if someone's got right. uh, a six Biomax 900s and someone's got a Biomax 300? Like, how do you account for all that? So that was the first reason. And the second reason was, um, Oh, all the health and censorship and all that sort of jazz. I was like, you know what? I don't want to be putting out health advice because every th my blog got hammered for doing that a few years ago. So I'm just right. going to focus more on the, the products. But it's so confusing. Like you can pull up studies and like, yeah, you'll find a study that shows this wavelength for this time or this dosage was really good. But then you find that they were using lasers or 
like like it's it's so confusing and I don't know. It's nice talking about this because it is, it allows me to sort of get these thoughts out there and, and have them reinforced um, by your experience as well. And it's frustrating because I would like to know what I should do after a hard gym session. You know, I would love to know right. the perfect treatment protocol for me. Okay. Disable <laughs> yeah. that wavelength, up the power intensity in that one, drop it in that one, five minutes this side, five minutes that side, done. Like, I'd love to know that, but it just, it just doesn't exist. And that's why we just have to experiment and just see what, what works well. And like you also touched on, um, we know that it does work, right? Like you can, right. you can just do a few minutes and you typically get a pretty good response. I mean, that's, I got a comment this morning, like someone just got a buy, uh, I don't know, Biomax or moderate or I don't know what panel it was. And yeah, that had knee pain for years. And they're like, Oh my God, within a week, like my knee pain's better. They're like, this is legit. Wow. You know, there's something to it. And it's like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, and that's a beautiful thing. Like chances are, you will see a positive improvement. It's just finding out exactly how to fine tune it for the optimal uh, result. Then that's that's the tricky thing. And we may be decades away from from ever really oh, yeah. fine tuning it because of all the variables we've mentioned. So um, yeah, hey, let's yeah, move on. I think. Um, Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I would just say yeah. There's a clear lack of studies around these red leg panels that we're talking about. Um, most of the studies are done with lasers. They're done with small cluster LED or laser devices. They're done with um, flexible pads, either with lasers or LEDs. We haven't seen many studies with actual red light therapy panels. So even give us a starting point or an indication of, of where we should be going and trying. I, I think last year, there was like a, a, a laser, you know, a, a PBM conference. I think it's called like uh, PBM 2021, you can look it up. Um, and last year I wrote to them, I was like, hey, you know, you've got this great agenda, but you're not, there's no mention of red light panels, which have dominated the whole commercial market for years. Don't you think you should have like a, have a, a talk, an agenda point that talks about this, that researches it, that encourages scientists to, to do more research with specifically red light panels? They're cheap. I could donate some for a study. I don't yeah. care. Um, you know what I mean? So it's not, you know, it just doesn't, it's a big gap between what the scientists and what the research want to do versus what the commercial market's doing is just doing its own thing and going off to this, this deep end of like bigger and more intensity. And there's no, you know, again, there's not a lot of science that's follow, at least following it up uh, that we would love to see. Um, so a lot of the, you know, information we have there is either extrapolated from laser studies or, or LED or small cluster studies. And it's that, you know, obviously dramatically extrapolated. And, and again, that's what started a lot of the high intensity stuff was that they were taking laser studies mm -hmm. and a laser is just inherently high intensity, but it's a very small spot. Like it's an, a laser could be like five milliwatts. It could be a hundred milliwatts. It could be maybe at most, you know, like a watt or a couple watts. And you measure your panels, even with your own um, technique that you measured the total watts, you get a hundred. So we're like a hundred yeah. times the energy <laughs> that we're applying to people. But oh, the study used you yeah. know, a laser that was 150 milliwatts per centimeter squared. So we need to engulf our whole body in the intensity of a laser. <laughs> I was like, well, we just like made a huge leap of, of an assumption there. So uh, that's, again, that's a lot of the assumptions that I'm trying to crack down on and say, well, let's reel it in, work with what we do know and what we do have. Um, you know, sunlight is a very good marker for mm -hmm. what we should and shouldn't be doing. Sunlight has about, um, depending on, on, there's ASTM, which is a, a standard that, that publishes it, or you can go outside with your Hopo color and measure yeah. the sunlight and let us know. But usually you're in about 30 to 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared in that red to near infrared range. Uh, you know, if you want to put a boundary on it, like 600 nanometers up to like 900 nanometers, mm -hmm. you know, and you can make that boundary a little bit higher if you want to include like 1100 up to like 1100. That's mostly non-thermal. Yeah. If you put that boundary on, you're between like, yeah, 30 to 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That's what we were evolved to feel. Um, you know, and again, we're, you know, our ancestors probably weren't sunbathers other than my French ancestors. They love sunbathing. But, 
you know, you're, you're probably in the shade a lot of times, you're, you're out in the sun sometimes, your body was, is designed to be accustomed to this, maybe at max 45 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That's like a very reasonable intensity as a starting point that we know the sunlight has been providing for us. A lot of people say, oh, the long-term studies, where are they? The sun's our long-term study. So, you know, you can use that as a baseline of like, okay, this is the reality, what our bodies were accustomed to deal with. Uh, and that, you know, and our blood and our skin is specifically tuned to thermoregulate, to deal with these light wavelengths, to use them for our benefit a lot of the times. Mm. And, and if once, and there are a few studies that say, once you start exceeding the intensity of sunlight, you know, even in red to near infrared range, once you start exceeding that by a couple factors, then you're, then you're in the, the danger zone again. And this is, you know, stop, stop looking at laser studies, start looking at large swaths of the body being engulfed in this intensity. It's so interesting. And as you say this, um, I'm, I'm now like rethinking my own protocol use because I've got a bit of tendonitis on my kneecap. I've been training relatively hard the last few months and yeah, I started getting a bit of pain and I was like, ah, oh, sweet. I'll, I'll start, uh, you know, doing a few more red light therapy sessions. But of course my go-to uh, setup now is you may have seen it. I've done videos on it, like the four Biomax 900, like this massive sort of wall panel. Right. So I do five, 10 minutes on that a couple of times a week. Right. But now uh, because my knee saw, I go over and turn that whole unit on, but I'm like, yeah. maybe I should just be getting like my little, you know, like a handheld right. one, like I have here or, or, you know, some of those torches that I know you sell some really small ones and just using yeah. that just on the knee instead of just hammering the whole body because the body's fine. It's just the knee, you know, like, yeah, and it's, it's, I think. And yeah, that's, I mean, a, a little bit of madness that I hear a lot of like, someone's like, Oh, I've got, you know, an ankle issue. Can I use the full body panel yeah, sure, on my door? And then lower it down to aim it at my ankle. And I was like, if you just have an ankle problem, just get a, you know, a smaller yeah. targeted light and, and target the ankle. And they're like, no, I got to, got to yeah, yeah. the whole body. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's, we, we haven't even talked about like biphasic dose response. I think we're assuming most people are kind of aware of that. Um, we're, we're, I mean, I'm talking mostly about like really grossly overdoing it with like, and you start to feel heat because, you know, apparently you know, if you have a biphasic dose response, that's the hormesis kind of curve where you say, okay, I need a reasonable amount of dose too much. And you start to get inhibitory actions. That's not productive for what we're trying to do. Um, and then obviously too little, you know, you don't get any effect. People have that figured out pretty easily. It's mm -hmm. the upper end of, of where, do, you know, how far do we go? Um, but I would say, you know, a lot of my research indicates that damaged cells do, you know, get more benefits from red light therapy than healthy cells. So it's kind of like, yeah, you should just be targeting your painful cells because those are the ones that need it. Those are the ones that respond best to it. If you're um, dosing healthy cells, then you're just more likely to hit a biphasic dose response with those healthy cells. There was um, one study, I, I think it was with rats, but they used aged rats versus young rats. And they did red light therapy, uh, transcranial on the brain and the aged rats did very well. They got, they got some great benefits. The younger rats didn't do so well. And they almost started to see that biphasic dose response. So there's a lot of people who might like buy a V light and they're like, Oh, everyone says it boosts your brain activity. And, and, you know, I'm going to be real smart, but <laughs> if you, if you don't have like an actual, mm. if you're a young person and you don't have like a real kind of brain issue, you know, are you, is it really a good idea to be, to be, you know, trying to treat your brain or trying to treat the whole body when it doesn't necessarily need it? I know our current lifestyle is very highly inflammatory and, and has a lot of problems and we need to beat that down. So occasionally mm. doing that, you yeah. know, once a week or, or, you know, at, at a low pace is fine to help stave off, you know, to get that anti-aging benefit, mm. but doing it too much, I don't, you know, you don't get super cells from red light therapy yeah. you just heal the cells that need it but your your normal cells don't get super it actually could work against right. them yeah it, it's interesting you mentioned the v light i had one uh, a few years ago and i, I was like, oh, i'll test it and um i was using it every day uh, maybe even twice a day 
And I was like, I want to quantify this. And I did some like before and after, you know, cognitive testing, uh, you know, paid, paid, subscribe to some service where you could go in and do memory tests and all these sort of tests and stuff. Oh, and, cool. and um, yeah, I, I didn't have any, I didn't see any changes like for the 30 days prior and then using it for 30 days. And I didn't feel any difference either. Like, um, so it's exactly what you said though, because I was, I don't know, 28, 29, maybe 30 when I did it. I don't think I have any serious like brain issues or anything like that, uh, cognitive issues. So just like you said, I mean, there was no like need for it in a way, because we know that the V-Light is like, I hear, I get emails, I get stories of people that have purchased it and have like massive changes and, you know, for, oh, yeah. with their parents who have like Alzheimer or dementia or, or they've had like some serious brain trauma and that. And um, yeah, they're like, wow, it's incredible. You know, so we know it works and we know the science backs it up as well. But if you don't have any underlying issues, um, is it going to work? Well, maybe not because there's nothing really to improve. And then it's funny though, because I understand that and I, I tell people that and I personally don't use it anymore because I didn't notice it and it's a bit clunky and stuff to wear. But then again, <laughs> I, will, I will use my red light therapy battles. <laughs> Right. even though i feel pretty well, good i'll just turn it on and do 10 minutes there so yeah maybe yeah, i'll have there, to I, there is some sort of draw to it of like getting yeah. that bright red light and it feels good maybe there's some sort of endorphin or, or rush and obviously even bright light therapy can help stimulate you and give you a little boost of energy so uh, there is definitely a draw to it it gets very almost uh i don't want to say addicting but it's you're very drawn to it and you, you want to do it, you know, once you get into it, you really want to do it. Yeah. Um, so there, 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 you know, and again, if you can't go outside and get some, some sunlight, if it's cloudy out, um, you know, it's perfectly reasonable. Again, if you use a reasonable amount of intensity that the sunlight would have delivered mm -hmm. and you can do that in the comfort of your own home, then, then that's always a good thing. Here's a quick one for you then. What would you personally, just on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't have any serious issues or like health issues or, or problems you're trying to fix. Um, and so you've got a full panel set up, you know, one of these thousand LED panels, the crazy big ones. Um, and it has the ability to drop, let's say it's, it's quite, it's putting out a lot of power, right? But it has the ability to, to, to drop it down, you know, in 10% steps. Would you, you're going to use it a couple of times a week, right? Uh, would you, a typical session, would it be say, a few minutes at full power or would it be longer say 10 to 20 minutes at a lower power based on I, yeah i would always do a little longer at the lower power lower. And yeah. that, that i mean it's kind of not explicitly written in a lot of studies i found one study in my blog about cumulative dosing and how often to do the dosing where they explicitly wrote it but i think it's like you know when you they're writing the methodology of why they choose certain parameters and why they do certain things. Um, they specifically said, and, and this is echoed a lot, is that you can't shorten the time and expect to get the same result. Even yeah. if you crank up the intensity and you mathematically calculate the right yeah. dose, um, you can't skimp on the time. The time itself is your dose, not the energy, the time is. And so really? that's, that's a huge kind of inflection point that people need to start paying attention to if you really want that uh, you know to be more apples to apples with the clinical literature you don't you don't want to skimp on the dose you want to you don't want to skimp on the time you want to decrease yeah. the intensity and have the right amount of time so i would get i'd rather have a reasonable amount of intensity and do it for 10 minutes or 20 minutes than a blast you know a huge amount of intensity it's just only five minutes um you know and and there was a study with a juve panel that that actually only did five minutes they did two and a half minutes on the front two and a half minutes on the back and they they found no si significant mm. improvement and it was pretty clear they didn't do enough time so yeah. you know i mean so uh, you know i don't know why they, they and they chose that time because of their mathematical assumption of the energy because mm. the juve is more powerful than most of the devices that they yeah. had used in prior studies they had some history of of using this amount of energy and getting a good result. But then, you know, with the non-contact treatment and then also um, shortening the time, they didn't get the results they were, they were expecting. So I think mm. don't skip on the time. If, you know, again, I don't, you know, if you're really short on time and that's all you can do, yeah, it's better, I'd say it's better than nothing. Um, but I'd say, you know, 
do a little bit longer and enjoy your time with the red light therapy, make sure your body gets that response. So um, yeah. the time is, is, you know, you, you can find that, I've, I've put it a lot of that into my blog of whenever I yeah. find a study that emphasizes time and not intensity or, or shortening the time because you got a high intensity, um, there's never a study that says, oh, we wanted to get the best result possible. So we found the highest intensity thing we could find and blasted, blasted, you know, the, the subject with it to make sure we got a benefit. They always use an appropriate amount of intensity an appropriate amount of time and all of the variables work together, you know, simultaneously. And you can't kind of mathematically juggle one for the other or try to extrapolate something that hasn't been really proven out yet. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, crazy. I want, I, I could talk about this for literally for hours, but yeah. I, I do want to focus on some of your products as well. Um, I will ask one more question on uh, the red light therapy space in general, and that's around the wavelength. So 660 and 850, someone with your background and understanding, you know, having been to China and that, did 660 and 850 emerge as the standard because that was the cheapest and most readily available LEDs? Or is that legit? They were the best, most well-researched, most promising wavelengths, or is it a combination of both? Yeah. I mean, it's always, you know, middle ground. I, I'd say um, those, those wavelengths were really commonly available at already being mass produced as grow lights. And then they were all already being mass produced for the near and for, for the infrared camera industry. Yeah, right. So even Dr. Hamblin would tell people in, in some of the early interviews that he had, he would get the little IR camera, um, mm -hmm. security camera floodlights. Yeah. And he'd say, oh, yeah, you can use that and you can blank out, you can blank out the light sensor because it only turns on at night, blank that out yeah. or remove it. And then, you know, you can use it on your head or use it on your parts of your body. And that was a cheap hack. Again, before yeah. a lot of the cheap panels came out, that's what people were doing. They were getting security cameras. They were 850 nanometer yeah. and, and they were using them on their body. So, you mm -hmm. know, I think there's a lot of cheap panels out there that people have kind of forgot about that hack. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I thought it was it was pretty funny. So, you know, I, you know, I don't know, it seemed kind of arbitrary that, um, you know, I'd say, again, Juve was was kind of the first company that I saw that was really he he gung ho again on this eight six sixty and 850 combination. And then, you know, I don't I don't ever remember them really proving out that formula. You know, mm -hmm. they didn't really, you know, they had some blogs and stuff. Uh, and again, they were cherry picking laser studies to justify their intensity that they weren't even delivering. Uh, so, you know, and then we get into wavelengths, how much are we going to trust that they had the right wavelengths when yeah. they're, they're pulling that kind of stuff on intensity? Um, so we got these wavelengths. They are very good wavelengths. Um, I did a, a, an analysis of um, Vladimir Helsikian's Excel data database. He, he mm -hmm. makes this uh, Google document that has like, you know, now it has almost like 7,000 studies. Oh, yeah. And I took that and I parsed it out and I analyzed just the number of studies that were done for each wavelength. Mm -hmm. And uh, 850 was pretty low on the totem mm -hmm. pole. You know, eight, 830 was much higher. That one seems to be much more popular as, as the, the mid near infrared. Uh, 810 and 808 if you know you can kind of combine them as yeah as the same thing because 808 is kind of a specific laser wavelength but if you're using led you're usually more around 810 and that's the low point for the absorption factors of our skin that gives us the best penetration in this this near infrared range so they prefer 810 for deeper penetration for brain studies um you know for for things like that so that's you know i think pretty sure uh, v light uses that in their, their products as a preference, because again, it, it gets that deeper penetration. It's more preferred for, for trying to reach the brain itself. Um, so, you know, again, it's, and then like you said, and then you're combining 660 and 850, there's, you know, not a ton of studies that, that combine wavelengths at all, because again, yeah. lasers are just inherently single wavelength. And only more recently, you know, more and more studies are using multiple wavelengths. There, are, you know, there have been some commentary in the studies of like, they, they generally seem synergistic whenever they do do a study where they combine red and near infrared, 
They seem like they, they are better than, you know, just using one. So red plus near infrared seems like a good synergy, but we haven't proved now, you know, should we be using 630 nanometer red? Should we use uh, 660? Six, uh, 670 is very popular for the um, eye health studies. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, they kind of skip over the 700s because the 700s don't have a lot of activity. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that why that is. But and then they get into 810, 808, you know, 8, 808 and 810, 830, 850. Um, and then, you know, there's a few more uh, interesting wavelengths, like a couple in the 900s. Those are usually like laser diodes. And then there's um, a lot of people are talking about um, 1064. Mm -hmm. And th those have had a couple of recent studies that that also has really good penetration because that's a low point of water absorption of water just happens to not absorb that wavelength very well. So that one gets through the skin pretty well. Um, and then so that we talked about penetration and why you want that. And again, with the red, that seems to be a little bit shallower pe penetration. So that's why they say it gets absorbed a, a, uh, more into the skin. It's more used for skin level, like kind of beauty treatments. Um, there's a lot of overlap of red and near infrared, so you don't have to get too fixated on, oh, if I want skin treatment, I need only red or, or near infrared. Like there's a lot of overlap. Um, but there's also the mechanisms that Tina Karu identified, and you can Google search Tina Karu action spectra of red light therapy. And she identified uh, four different peaks of red and near infrared. I'll have to look up the exact ones, but um, but they're not they're not uh, what what we think they are. Uh, give me one second. I'll look it up. Mm, sure. And I'll put links uh, to as much of these resources and articles we're talking about, including the the Google document with um, you know your six seven thousand um, studies, and I'll put links to all of that below. Uh, and be sure to head over to Andrew's website jimbered.com and check out his blog because his blog is absolutely amazing uh, for for going deeper into some of these topics. Like I said, I could talk about this stuff for, for days, but uh, we don't have days. So Okay, so here's some peaks proliferating culture. So she writes here um, 623.5, which I didn't, sometimes I forget that you can split a wavelength. You can have half a wavelength. Can you know? Can you imagine if we start talking about half a wavelength? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so six twenty three point five, uh, six hundred seventy one point five. So six seventy one. So again, that's that's the you know, like I said, popular for um, for the eyes. It's a little bit harder to find. I just recently did one product with with six seventy. Um, there is a peak at six seventy six, but then a lot of people say you know the studies don't really confirm that that's a interesting wavelength and then there's 812 so those are some of the peaks and you can find it like i said um she's got this big free kind of website that talks about the title is action spectra their importance for low level light therapy by tina karu k-a-r-r-u and you can find and so that's another theory so you've got which wavelengths penetrate the best it seems to be um it kind of meets up at 810 um, and then which ones potentially have the highest kind of absorption or stimulation. Uh, but, but again, actually this theory, I, um, there's a lot of contrary information about it that maybe red light therapy is just getting absorbed into the interstitial water in your mitochondria mm -hmm. and it's forming easy water and it's making the ATP production more efficient. Um, so there's some competing theories, maybe there's multiple theories, um, but so you can look at it that way. But again, you know, there's not a lot of converging information as far as I can say that 660 and 850 are some magical combination. Again, we saw that maybe introduced by Juve and then everyone wanted to copy Juve's formula and just say, oh, we've got Juve's formula and we're offering it for you for cheaper. And then it creates this huge confirmation bias that now we have you know dozens and dozens of companies that just sell 660 and 850 so brand new people to this industry will yeah. come in and say this has to be the magical formula everyone's doing it 
and, you know, if everyone's doing it, it's got to be the, the best thing to do. Um, so it made this huge confirmation bias. And now Juve is actually using that kind of against people. And they're yeah. saying, oh, if you don't use our wavelengths you're, and you start to use some of these other weird wavelengths that mm. we don't say is great, if you use all these weird wavelengths, you're diluting your, your benefits. You're, <laughs> you're bringing down the benefits. We established 660 and 850. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you dilute our wavelength formula, then you're not doing it right. You're not going to get any of the benefits. And again, no, no substantiation. They're just like planting all these seeds of doubt in people of like, oh, if you don't buy our panels, our panels are super safe now. We we got a couple new certifications and they're mm-hmm. they're so safe. <laughs> but it's kind of like they're really, you know, using <laughs> some of the it's it's kind of come full full circle of like they started this and now everyone assumes there there's some magical formula. And now they're saying, oh, don't deviate from our formula. You don't know what could happen. Um, so, you know, again, I'd be, I've, been, I've been including 630 nanometers in, in almost all my panels since I started. Um, I really like that wavelength. It's a bright, it's a brighter kind of wavelength too. It's like more of a yellowish orange and it's a really nice color. Uh, but it also ha- it has a lot of basis in clinical studies. Again, that was maybe because of what your original question was, was that was one of the first lasers that was studied is six, the 633 laser. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like the laser you use to, to you know, tease your cat and make it run yeah. around and chase yeah. it. Yeah, chase the laser. It, that was a cheap laser. It was commonly available. So then the scientists get a hold of them and they start experimenting on people with them. Um, so you know, again, the the even the scientists are getting what's available to them, what they what's what you know what they have on the shelves, what they can find, and maybe their studies are just using not necessarily the best wavelengths. Again, we're we're sometimes restricted on what wavelengths you can use based on the diodes and the technology and the semiconductor technology so you can only produce certain frequencies Mm -hmm. based on the the diodes you can't say oh okay i want some weird wavelength like uh 640 42 i don't you know i don't know Mm -hmm. you know it's it's not really a a, and a half point Mm -hmm. yeah 0.75 so you know there's there's limitations to which you can even study in the first place so um, yeah, the, again, there's a lot to learn about wavelengths. I think we need to be more open-minded about totally. alternative wavelengths and mm-hmm. deviating from the, 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 the formula that you've, you've made up. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think now, you know, Platinum LED, Mito Red, uh, they've, they've been brave enough to, to go off the formula yeah. and start to do their own thing. Um, and, I've, I, and that's what I wanted to use my Gemba Red Overclocks for, mm-hmm as I always try to educate people with my products, because I know a lot of people don't buy my products, but I used, I used my products as education mm-hmm. to say, hey, I'm, I'm biasing my near infrared spectrum with more of these 810 and 830 that have more clinical studies behind them that have better penetration, you know, according to the studies, than 850. Um, so, you know, those two, I, w- I would say, are, are pretty clearly s- superior to 850. And again, we can say that's marginal. I, I was listening to a, uh, an interview with Dr. Hamblin, and he said he's measured all these different wavelengths. He's, a, he's taken all these observations. And he does, you know, when you really m- test this out on people, they get the same benefits. You know what I mean? So ultimately, it ends up kind of washing out. And, and, you know, you get the same benefits. It doesn't matter if you're a, a couple different wavelengths one way or another. Um, but I think, yeah, we need to be more open-minded to, to new wavelengths, to different wavelengths. And again, be kind of more brave enough to, to try different wavelengths and see which ones work. Totally. I, I want to talk more about your overclock panel, but I'll quickly share a, a little story. I I received an email not long ago from someone wanting to buy uh, a couple of panels, I think it was. And they were like, look, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't want to, what was the word? Like, I don't want to experiment or I don't want to risk, uh, you know, all these al- alternative wavelengths. I'm like, oh gosh, that's, that's something that I've created. Um, but they're like, I just want to stick to the, the, you know, traditional six, uh, 660 and 850. And I'm kind of like, right. Fair enough, you know, but I'm like, I'm curious as to how someone's come to that conclusion. And 
after you know talking to you the last few minutes now it's 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 clear it's just the marketing right like you it, pretty much every company is like that's the standard and it's it's sort of been shown that these other wavelengths are like new and they're sort of fringe and they haven't really been tested and quantified yet and again i'm not helping this situation by coming out and calling them alternative wavelengths i was just uh i don't know i don't know that just came out right there i I I mean i didn't know what to call them i was like the other wavelengths the the non-traditional you know and and obviously that sort of stuck but it's yeah it's every website you go to 660 850 and then maybe some other ones uh got these other other wavelengths and i know some people you know, even with the um, Biomax, when they first brought out their Biomax series, um, Platinum LED brought this Biomax out with those other wavelengths in it. And a lot of people just brushed it off as, oh, they're just trying to separate them. It's just a marketing employee. You know, they're trying to separate right. themselves from, from you know, the other companies. And I mean, you could you could think that was legit and stuff, but they they put out a lot of articles showing the benefits of those wavelengths and and I feel like in a way they sort of hedged their their bets a little bit because they only went I think twenty percent into those other right. wavelengths and then left left the bulk at, at um six sixty and eight fifty and now you've got like Mito Red and they've gone twenty five percent between four different wavelengths uh, you've got Light Path LED I know he's uh, Scott's a big fan of eight ten so he's got a lot of that in it and then of course your your new panel which is your what did you call it your overclock panel right your overclock panel. Panel. yeah so tell me so yeah. what are the wavelengths that you've ran in that and what is the breakdown is it an even split so i've got uh 630 660 810 830 and 850 so five wavelengths um i'm still doing 50 percent red and 50 percent near infrared mm-hmm. um <laughs> And again, that makes it easy to create the circuit board with half the LEDs right, okay. red and half the LEDs near infrared. Um, but uh, so yeah, so it's, so it's twenty five percent six thirty, twenty five percent six sixty. Yeah, fourteen percent is uh, eight ten, twenty two percent is eight thirty, and then another fourteen percent is eight fifty. Yeah, interesting. Um, so. Okay. So it's more, yeah, it's a little bit more heavy on the 830 because uh, there's a lot more studies in the 830 um, than and I would say uh, most of the other wavelengths. Um, but then, you know, I still have some 810 and 850. And again, even LEDs, they have, um, you know, plus or minus like 10 or 15 nanometers on oh, either yeah. side yeah. As, as kind of a distribution. And actually, yeah, I show the distribution on my website. So, you know, you could, I mean, it gets redu- at some point it gets a little redundant because uh, eight thirty is is so close. It does emit some eight ten yeah. as well, but you you want a little bit of eight ten in there too. Um, so, you know, so yeah, so you know, I wanted to get get more of those multiple wavelengths out there. A lot of the customers that that are interested in me, yeah, they want as many wavelengths as as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, Again, maybe it's more of a broad spectrum thing. Maybe they want more like kind of a sunlight kind of deal that gives you all, all the wavelengths. Uh, or maybe they're trying to hedge their bets with different uh, action spectra and penetration levels and, and different mechanisms that you can, you can try to cover more with different wavelengths. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised no company has twisted uh, their marketing a little bit and... Um, instead of just saying we use 660 and 850 or whatever wavelengths they're using, they say we use 650 to 670 and 830 right. to 855. Because I notice that when I'm testing it, like let's say the claim peak is 660, but I actually see the real peak is 665. But if you scroll across with the with the spectrometer I have here, or you pull the data into a spreadsheet, you see that like let's say the peak is 665. You can go down to say 655, I'm just pulling numbers from there here. And you see you're still getting 95% or 90% of the energy you're getting at your peak. So it's like, well, you you are getting that wavelength and you're getting the wavelengths over there. And then all of a sudden, if you, I'm looking at your graph um, on your website and I'll put a link to this below, the third party verified spectrum. So you've got the breakdown of all the wavelengths and the energy levels. Like you're, you're getting a ton of energy from say 800 through to, 855 you know and likewise with the red yeah. uh i'm just trying to uh guess what figures are here maybe 620 all the way to you know 675 like 
right. you're getting coverage of all those wavelengths. And I think a lot of people don't understand that because they just think it's 660 and then 661, there's nothing. But it's not their case. Like yeah. there's a lot of light going through there. So I, I, I've been, I, I think I, I mentioned uh, I, a video years ago and no one's obviously picked up on it, but it wouldn't surprise me if one day a company comes out and they're like, oh, we're better than everyone else because, because we've got a range right. of wavelengths. And it's like, well, yeah. fair enough, you know. Um, but it is interesting. But, yeah, but, and I've, you know, I tried to kind of describe that more in my FAQ when I first came out. And like you said, no one picks up on it. If you start to talk in like these ranges and stuff, they probably will just assume that you're trying to be more deceptive than just yeah. saying what the what the peak is or what the center number is. So, and again, there's different definitions. Is it the peak or is it the center number? Or, right. the, yeah. you know, sometimes it kind of can move a little bit. It can yep. shift depending on your measurement device or the temperature. Um, so, yeah, and I've got the third party peaks where, you know, so I, I give you what exactly the third party measured was 635, yeah. 663, 817, 835, and 840. 48 so you yeah. can see you know and i always question my lab i'm like oh these you know it, it got skewed a couple nanometers higher than than what my specification was from my supplier mm. you know i always check and they're like no we calibrate this twice we measured yeah. it twice like every fine um, but you know you, you get a little bit of wavelength drift of, of what the actual peak is too and then you get that wider spectrum but totally. you try to say oh you know we're between certain wavelengths that just starts to get a little weird and vague for people. So, someone um, will do it. I know, like someone will, yeah. will, will, will try exploit it. But again, this just adds another variable, another thing to you, you need yeah. to try and control when you're trying to test these things. Like it's, yeah, it's insane. Um, but hey, let's go back to your overclock panel. So I, I haven't used that. I haven't tested it. I've looked at the specs on, on paper. It looks pretty neat. But how does it compare to um, the one, your Gemberid panel that I had in my 2021 um, comparison series? Uh, ha ha what, what's improved? Um, yeah, so you had the reboot panel. That's yeah. kind of like what, what you would think as a classical red light panel that um, the reboot uh, panel that I sent you that you reviewed, that's a standard 36 inch tall uh, kind of, you know, nine or 10 inches wide. And again, even that's kind of a carryover from, you know, when, when companies were retrofitting grow lights, that 36 inch, that, that three foot tall. Yeah. And a lot of companies were kind of calling that as a body light, but really yeah. if you're six feet <laughs> tall, that's, that's yeah. half your body. Yeah. Um, you know, so even those, those dimensions and you can still see Juve's doing those dimensions and things mm. like that. Those are kind of a carryover of, of like, was it designed for humans or for grow lights? And was it just kind of a retrofit? Um, so anyway, the overclock is a little bit more tailored towards human dimensions of um, the, the total height is six inches taller than the 36 six inch uh, part. Yes. So you got down an extra six inches, which feels like a lot more wholesome when you get yeah. that extra six inches. Um, that feels like you get much more coverage of your torso. And yeah. then it's, um, I think it's an extra inch or two wider as well. So you get, we get a, we fit in a whole extra row of LEDs on the side as well. Um, so again, that feels like much more wholesome, especially if you're kind of a bigger guy. Um, so, you know, that's, that's nice. You get more coverage. You just need one panel. It's not modular. I'm not into all that modular stuff. Mm -hmm. um, just really simple kind of setup. Um, let's see what else. So it's got the five wavelengths. It's got the nice, you know, kind of bigger dimensions. Um, that's a little bit better for bigger people. Um, the in I'd say the intensity is is pretty similar to the reboot. It's uh, we got forty three milliwatts per centimeter squared at six inches away. Again, like I said, I'm trying to get in there with like a reasonable intensity that most people will be comfortable with. And then again, you have more control. I use sixty degree beam angle. Again, I think that's the same with the reboot. Mm -hmm. But with the 60 degree beam angle, you have more control. If you move to 12 inches away or 18 inches away, you have that good control of the intensity without having to stand on the opposite side of the room. And, and like, if you want a lower dose, like, so um, I think it's, it gives you that very good, good amount of control. Um, the total optical Watts is kind of proportional to the size. So you get 106 Watts. Again, that's kind of like uh, 25 to 30% more po total power output than the reboot mm -hmm. um but again it's you know it's a 
a good amount of intensity. It's I think it's the right amount to be to be dosing people with, uh, without you know, potentially causing problems. And you know sometimes you don't want to be very far away from a, a panel. Yeah. And it's kind of inconvenient to be far away from the panel if you've got a small closet or a yeah. bathroom you're trying to do this in. Um, you know, obviously EMFs are super low, flicker super low. I get the flicker third party tested as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's all, that's all great. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, the other thing, yeah, it's got a nice little control panel. Um, I think, yeah. So it's got the control panel with the timer. Uh, you can control red and near infrared separately, which I don't even include with most most of my panels. Cause I think it's better just to use both, you know, red and near infrared simultaneously most of the time that's what i include in the guide of like yeah if you know if you have no other reason to just use both simultaneously all the time Mm -hmm. um you know unless some people are particularly afraid of near infrared for certain reasons because they read oh near infrared's bad for your eyes or something but it's more the intensity and not the wavelength so um generally i just say use both simultaneously but you do have that control um, like I said, it's got a simple touch controller for on off yeah. the wavelengths and the uh, time. So, yeah, uh, you know, again, I, you know, it's a simple panel, but I think it's, it's bigger, it's sturdy. Um, you know, it's, it's a good, really good product. And I do, I added the mounting holes and yeah. I've got um, like eight, 10 TV stands in my office right now. Yeah. And they mount it'll mount Mm -hmm. on any generic tv stand so i don't need to distribute tv like tv stands or or, uh, upright stands that some companies are selling like for like 300 dollars yeah you can get them on amazon for like 150 or or 120 and it even the stand itself comes with all the right screws and the mounting Mm -hmm. tools and you can stand it on a, t- a big, you know, one of the heavy duty TV stands, not a cheap one. Yeah. And, and it'll stand on a wheeled stand. And it's just mm-hmm. like, you know, what, what you can get from, from most of the companies. They're just rebranding yeah. TV stands now. Oh. And they're selling them as stands for their panels. Yeah, I received a photo from someone uh, just a week or two ago. And they bought, they bought a couple of panels, connected them all together. And yeah, they brought um, a, a big heavy duty TV stand that folds out. You know, you can you can bring it oh, out off the nice. wall and change the angle. Yeah, and they with had an it, ar- with more like an arm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like a yeah, couple yeah. of pivot points in there, so you could change the angles and stuff. Oh, and yeah. they um, had it. I think it was in like a walk-in wardrobe or big bathroom. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, they cost them like eighty bucks or something for the same. And they have four panels. I don't know what company panels they were, but you know, they're thirty odd pounds each. And he, it was awesome. Like he just pushed it to the wall when he wasn't um, using it, like it yeah. sort of tucked away. And then he just pulled it out and he was like, I saved, you know, a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, dude, and he said, yeah, it all lined up perfectly. So um, yeah, yeah there's a, that's a really neat little hack. And it's something I'm going to have to start mentioning as well, because some companies are charging insane amounts for their stands. And I'm like, right. this is just ridiculous. Like, come on. I mean, and then you've got um, Juve who like all of a sudden have brought in their own <laughs> stand mechanisms and whenever i do reviews like yeah. comparisons and I'll, I'll typically hang all the panels on a wall so i can just you know walk next to them and stuff and then you got juve and they got nowhere to hang it you've got to pay like 200 bucks for like a wall hanger seriously or if you want to hang it from a door you got to buy the door hanging accessory it's oh. like seriously guys yeah. like you're already paying <laughs> so much for this but we, anyway, I'll, I'll save those uh, complaints for, for, for the um, Juve reviews I do. But yeah, it is a, a nice little hack and it's something that I'm going to have to start mentioning more of in, in the videos uh, to try to save people some money. So, hey, look, I'm really impressed um, with the overclock panel. And I think what you've done with the um, with your wavelengths is, is quite, it's unique, but it's I like it because some thought has gone into it. It's not just, hey, what's the market doing? Copy paste or, Hey, what, what are the cheapest LEDs to get? You know, let's throw them in. So I, I really do like that. And I, you know, anyone that's listened uh, to this interview so far with podcast so far, will know that, you know, you know, your stuff and and you're passionate about it and you, you read the science and that as well. So if someone is, um you know, keen to start off in, in red light therapy and wants to get something that has had a lot of thought and um care gone into it you know that overclock panel is, is definitely something you should check out uh but i also know you've got a lot of products on your website so uh jimbury.com you click on all products i mean what's this 20 odd products and there's everything on here uh what do we got we got like 
uh, a sensor light, reading light, moonlight, night light strips, a desk lamp. Uh, of course, then we've got your, your panels, your reboot, your overclocked, you've got handheld ones, um, you've got tabletop, you, you've got all sorts on there, which, which is kind of neat because typically you go to a red light therapy site and it's, you know, your, your body panel, maybe a handheld one and maybe a tabletop. Uh, and then maybe you can get a couple of them and join them together. But it's pretty neat uh, seeing all these different products on there. Um, you know, the reading lights yeah. and, and the moon one and stuff, pretty, pretty cool. So obviously they're not necessarily used uh from a therapeutic point of view like the, your reading lamps and stuff right it's more just to minimize the blue light exposure exposure at night i'm assuming that's why the products were created yeah yeah and you know that's the thing with the circadian rhythm a lot yeah. of people have been using red light therapy panels and they leave them on you know at mm. night as kind of a reading light or they're leaving them on as kind of an ambient light and you know i noticed more and more people doing this and i was like wow there actually aren't a lot of products that are red kind of nightlight solutions. Like, you know what I mean? And even Juve added that ambient red mode to yeah. it. So uh, I'm sure they they kind of got that feedback as well that yeah. people just kind of want to use it as an ambient light, a mood light to help with their circadian rhythm, uh, generally because you want to avoid too much uh, blue light or green light at night because that stimulates, that stops your melatonin production at night, which you know, lowers your quality of sleep. So if you can use more of the red lights, um, and I was kind of one of the first people on the market making red clip likes for, for yeah. books, you know, you could clip, clip it right onto your book and read it. And it's like kind of a dim red light um, because comparatively red is just kind of always dimmer than white light. So some it's kind of takes some getting used to of, of kind of walking around at night with yeah. mostly red lights. Um, you know, and I've got a desk lamp that's more powerful. And especially if you have like a desk nearby your bed, or if you want to use it and we're working late at night, I've got that desk lamp. I've got um, night lights, which are, are getting really popular because night lights are a nightmare for flicker and things like that. So it's hard to find good quality night lights and, and then that, you know, with the red as well. Um, so, you know, those are all great solutions. So it's kind of like a separate side of my business is, you know, the night lights and lighting solutions, which, you know, I've always been passionate about is just kind of in improving your sleep and getting the blue blockers and, and getting the, the right lights at night and trying to block the, the bad kind of uh, colors on the wavelength. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've kind of branched into all different kinds of panels and things like that. And like you said, a lot of the companies are more formulaic of like, okay, we've got a big version. And then we got a slightly smaller version and then maybe a handheld version. And it's all kind of the same thing, but it's just scaled down. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I don't do that because, you know, why not make things as confusing as possible? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I've got, you know, I've got the body lights, which again, the body lights for me came last. Right. Um, and, and I started with the Kemba Red Groove, which, which is two ninety nine, and then I, and then I went into the Rex, which is, 379, again, I was one of the first people doing three wavelengths and four wavelengths. Um, I think as early as 2018, I was doing three, three wavelengths and four wavelengths. I was, I was quite a pioneer. And then people email me and they're like, hey, have you heard about this platinum LED guys? They're crazy. They're using four wavelengths. So like I've been doing four yeah. wavelengths, but nobody just, nobody visits my website. But anyway, so I'm like, yeah, they're, they are great wavelengths. I've been doing it. Um, so anyway, uh, so those are great. Those are really lightweight, those, but they're large. And um, I just tell people, lean it right on your skin. You don't have to mount it. You don't have to hang it on a wall. You don't have to put it on a stand. You just lay it right on your skin. Again, like most of the studies, they just use lasers and they press it right on, onto the skin. There's no cal you know, calculations of distance and mm -hmm. you know, intensity and things like that. It's, you know, it's low enough intensity that it works for most people for most purposes. It's not going to overheat you. Um, so those are really great. Those are two of my top sellers still, again, because they're simple. Oh. It travels by word of mouth. I don't get good reviews on them because yeah. they're low intensity yeah. and everyone says, oh, you can't get good benefits yeah. if it's got low intensity. I'm <laughs> like, well, I don't know. Talk to my customers, I guess, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, because yeah. they're they're enjoying it. They're talking about it to their friends. I'm enjoying it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things. You can judge it by the numbers, but sometimes you just, you truly do have to try it out yourself. Um, and then I've got newer products like the Gimba Red Beacon. I'm very proud of. Again, that one does have a 
built-in stand that's ultra low EMF because I separated the power adapter and there's no fans in it. There's no oh. fans in most of my smaller panels. Yeah. Um, and so that the fans cause some magnetic field and that's inherent in most panels. And then having the power driver or the power adapter, which is usually inside those panels, that's usually, and that, that's also why they're usually like uh, almost two inches thick. Uh, most yeah. of the panels you review. This one's even thinner. This one's almost like an inch thick. So it's really oh. nice, thin and lightweight. Um, you can use it up close, but it's pretty high intensity up close because it's right. using the three watt diodes um, and you can use it further away. So you get that flexibility. It's ultra low EMF. So, you know, a lot of my customers care about EMF. That's why they come to me mm -hmm. and they can reliably get low EMF stuff. Um, you know, and a lot of that came from feedback from my customers. There's also this kind of mentality that I'm some, you know, marketing genius and that I'll fear monger people about EMFs and then I'll make tons of money by selling no EMF products. But really it came from, you know, my customers, they were following Jack Cruz, they were following Dr. Mercola, they were following you and, and, and uh, maybe Ben Greenfield. And they all say, hey, reduce your EMF exposure. And so when you're buying a health product in the biohacking space, mm. the first question of a lot of people, especially early on, they'd say, what's the EMFs with your products? How low is it? You know, is it safe uh, from an EMF standpoint? So again, I listen to my customers and they drive me to, to reduce the EMFs as low as possible. I've never gotten anyone asking me for a high EMF product. So, yeah. you know, if somebody asked me for that, I don't know if I would oblige, but you know, no, nobody asks for high EMF products. So I just make low EMF products. You know, I listen to the customer um, and I try not to be a doctor and say, well, you use a, a cell phone, don't you? You use yeah. a computer uh, unless you throw those out. I'm not going to reduce the EMFs on my products. Yeah. Like that seems really rude. Um, yeah. But I, I've shopped for, you know, infrared heating mats. And that was the answer I got from one company. And they were like, oh, well, we're FDA approved. It was a heating mat. So a lot of heating mats have to get FDA approved or registered. And they're like, well, we're FDA registered. I was like, hey, listen, <laughs> gluten, gluten is FDA approved as a, a, a food source for human, right? But some humans are deathly allergic to it. Yeah. So if somebody asks you what your EMFs are and you just tell them, oh, the, the FDA says my EMFs are fine, the FDA is not looking at EMFs, first of all. And second off, the FDA, <laughs> you know, approves stuff that, you know, if you have a particular sensitivity, yeah. you know, it, it's not relevant. So, uh, you know, I, I get frustrated even when I'm shopping for my own uh, personal, you know, items. Um, and you get get all these kind of fallacies of like, just respect me and tell me the numbers or yeah, tell me yeah. you don't have them. Um, that's fine. So anyway, all, yeah, the Beacon's ultra low EMF. And then I've got the Vector. I've got two models of the Vector, also ultra low EMF, because again, separated the power adapter, mm -hmm. no fans inside. Um, they're smaller um, in four, you know, four wavelengths. And then I've got a Vector 670, which is just the 670 nanometer wavelength and i use um uh diffused um lenses that you know you don't really see a lot of diffused lenses because whenever i ask a supplier in china for a diffused lens they say oh my god that's going to reduce your intensity um and i'm like no i want diffused lenses it's better for your eyes um so you you get and especially for the 670 you want the right amount of intensity you don't want too much intensity because this one's a little bit more for supporting eye health right. um and so especially you don't you don't want to go too high yeah. it's just that one wavelength cool. for kind of a singular purpose yeah, um great. it's kind of like you said it's kind of risky to do something that's more like a nuanced purpose because then you start to imply kind of medical stuff yeah. um but like i said it just kind of supports eye health in general mm -hmm. um even the studies that conducted it was more like they did some sort of test on your color vision mm -hmm. and the the people that that you know were studied they had a better discernment of certain colors and a in a very specific color test so it's not like a big medical condition like you get yeah. a slightly better discernment of color vision maybe it helps you in the long run again with supporting the mitochondria in the eyes um, so, you know, that's a really nice one. I leave that on my desk and I use that while I'm just kind of typing on my computer. 
I'll turn that on and it's just got a 10 minute timer. So it just shuts itself off. And I'll do, you know, maybe if I remember to turn it on, I'll do that once or twice a day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, you know, that's nice. And uh, yeah, I've got a couple of handhelds. The handhelds aren't, aren't doing, you know, too well. Uh, you know, I kind of, like I said, I kind of let my customers decide if, if they're not buying it as much. I'm going to probably focus on some other kind of newer products that I'm, I've been working on. So speaking of that, I know the overclock panel is, is relatively new, but are there any exciting projects you are working on or any new products coming down the pipeline that we can see later this year or into next year? Anything yeah, that you I kind of mentioned, um, I was working with a, a measurement uh, company that has been doing uh, measurement devices for like 50 years. They really know that what they're doing, they calibrate it to NIST standards, which is the national national institute of standards and technology which like if you get anything calibrated it's to that to their standards um even for light measurements and um we're going to get it calibrated to the right wavelengths and flatten out that response curve so that way it's accurate for red light therapy and i think that would be a huge and it just is a simple display of milliwatts per centimeter squared and that's would would be like a game changer like i said maybe if i could work with institutions maybe i work with professionals and and get that into the hands like i said there's even controversy in the studies themselves that maybe you know things aren't being measured right so i think that would be a huge thing more for the industry it's not a big money maker um, but it it would really help with the science and, and getting the right information out there um i'm always dabbling with new products uh I might be finally getting an even bigger panel um, yeah. than, than the overclocked. But again, that might be more for like, sometimes I get questions of like a clinical size, like a size for like a clinic that right. they want to charge for sessions for or whatever. Yeah. It's not really more of a home use thing. And then I've gotten a lot of, and you've actually asked me about this a while ago, and now I'm, I'm trying to do it is do something that's more waterproof. Mm. So like a, a red light panel, that's um, sealed enough. And I just did a post on Instagram that my Gemba Red Beam, which is you know one of my older products and it's one of my favorite, it's a floodlight mm, and yep. it's water resistant. And I showed it under the sink and I was you know letting water yeah. run over it and it doesn't, doesn't affect it because it's sealed for yeah, you know, wow. water tight. Um, so anyway, I'm trying to get like kind of a thinner profile panel that's water sealed that is a little bit more suitable for like bathrooms and maybe even sauna if it can if it can tolerate those temperatures um because you know again that's that's something a lot of people ask for i think i've been always kind of like yeah you don't really need to do red light therapy in the sauna but um you know if people want it they can they can try it out and, and see what they like um but you know that that seems to have a lot of interest so i've been trying to work on that um, but yeah, I'm always dabbling with things. It's hard for me to announce what I'm working on because sometimes I just scrap a product and I do all this testing and I think it's great for like a couple of weeks and then I'm like over it and, yeah. and I move on to something else. So yeah. Very exciting. So or if anyone wants to um, keep in the loop, just head over to your website. Now, I've been pronouncing your your company name, uh, <laughs> name uh, Jimba Red, but I realize yeah. it's, uh, how, how do you say it? Gamba Red. Now, I think this is like the fourth time I've tripped up on a company's uh, pronunciation. In fact, the other day, someone hit me up about Juve. They were like, no, it's not Juve, it's Juvie. And I'm like... I'm yeah, some true. people say Jovi or Juvie. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Violite, I used it's, to always no, it's say just it as, as V-Light. And sometimes like, it's no, yeah. it's Violite. Um, the worst one was Rogue, uh, and I said it was Rogue, and that was just my brain wasn't processing it and then the whole video went out so i do apologize for that <laughs> isn't um, it rouge like like the french word for red yeah rouge. yeah, yeah. Which, yeah okay. of course and i <laughs> on that one so i apologize so i also yeah. apologize to you um so yeah anyway head over to i'll put a link below so you can you can uh people can head straight over there check out andrew's blog because it is really really neat there's some epic stuff over there. And like I said, it's it's my go-to resource for a lot of the times. And it's why for those of you that have been following my work, you know, you would have seen a lot of articles and that shared uh, in my videos and articles um, of my own. So check that out. Um, and I, I really appreciate your time. And yeah, I, I said at the start, 45 to 60 minutes, but there was just so much stuff to cover. And in fact, I've got 
I've got so many topics here that I wanted to touch on and yeah, we didn't even get a chance to talk about that. So we'll have to do something, uh, something else of uh, part two later on in the year. Um, and we can touch on some of these other questions, but again, I, I thank you for your time. I thank you for all the help uh, and assistance you've given me, which in turn has helped uh, readers and, and viewers. And um, also for the work you've been doing um, for the industry as a whole, because I know, yeah, a lot of your, your, um, research and you know your decisions that you have made and that have filtered through uh to the rest of the market so i do thank you uh for that as well so um yeah again it was a great chat and i look forward to chatting yep. again yeah thanks for having me all right and that's a wrap how good was andrew uh, i told you he's full of knowledge bombs isn't he and um he, he knows this stuff and you can tell that he he's he's into it like he's passionate about this stuff he goes and reads the science um, he speaks to the guys in China and he, he gets the product that he believes is, is going to be the best. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do have any questions for myself or Andrew, please leave them below and I'll make sure he can um, come in and chip in with his answers. Head over to his website. I'll put a link to that below, uh, gimbered.com. And again, use discount code Alex if you are going to place an order over there. I really want to do a part two with Andrew because I, like I said in the video, I have, um, I've got a lot of questions and topics that I wanted to touch on, but we just ran out of time. So if there's, if you would like me to do a, a second part, uh, and if there's something you want me to cover in that second part, yeah, again, leave that video, uh, leave those ideas and comments below. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified if I do fo uh, do, do follow up videos. And um, otherwise, I'll see you in the next video. All right, guys. Thanks. Bye.